Hello everyone, my name is Corey Campbell and I'm the Gallery Associate here at Japan Society. And I'm gonna give you a quick walkthrough of our spring exhibition, Points of Departure, Treasures of Japan from the Brooklyn Museum. This is a unique survey exhibition, possibly the very first one that Japan Society has ever done, in which we cover roughly about 2,000 years of art making history in one exhibition. So what we've done is rather than organize the exhibition chronologically, we've divided the exhibition up by the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. And by allowing us to focus on specific regions, it allows us to really absorb the vast differences throughout Japanese art throughout the centuries. So the very first object I wanna to talk to you about is this Emma here. Emmas are votive plaques, which are typically seen in Japan's indigenous Shinto religion. But this plaque is a little bit unusual for a couple of reasons. One, we know the exact date that this Emma was created because the artist actually put the exact date, August 12, 1875, right here on the front of the Emma. Even more unusually, he actually signed it. We know his name from the impressions of the seals that are left on this Emma. The artist's name was Bayo, but that's literally all we know about him. Now, this Emma shows us an early story from Japanese creation myth. Here we see the sun goddess Amaterasu. She's locked herself in her cave after she's become very angry with her brother Susanoo after he's defiled their heavenly temple. So by sealing herself in this cave, she's also sealed off the main light source for the entire planet. So all of the other gods come to her and beg to her to please come out, please come out, and she doesn't listen to them until the goddess of mirth, Uzume, gets a genius idea. She sets up a, basically a little stage right outside of Amaterasu's cave, and a tree, the sacred Sakaki tree, which was right outside of Amaterasu's cave, she hangs her props. So now that Uzume has got her stage set, she starts her performance, which was a lewd and body dance. The more the gods laugh, the more Amaterasu is wondering what's going on out there. Until she finally can't take it anymore and pushes the rock away and sticks her head out to see what's so funny. And all the other gods take this opportunity to grab Amaterasu and pull her out of the cave. And that is the image that is shown here on this Emma. As we continue through the south section, our change in focus moves to ceramic and stoneware production because the islands of Kyushu have been long held as the center of stoneware and ceramic production in Japan for centuries. This is by an artist named Kitamura Junko, and this work is something called Vase. It was done in 1991. She first created the shape, and then before she actually fired it, she took black clay and then covered over her form. Then once that form was covered with the black clay, she comes through and she cuts out all of these triangular patterns in it and then fires it for the first time at a very low temperature. After it's been fired, which stabilizes all of the base materials, she comes in and she adds in white clay in all of the triangles that she has cut out by hand and then refires it again a second time. So just the amount of labor that she has put into this is mind boggling. The second section of the exhibition is devoted to the West, which we are identifying specifically as Kyoto. And right behind me, we have a pair of screens that is a style of genre painting called Rakuchu Rakugaizu, which literally translates as views in and around the capital, which would have naturally been understood to mean Kyoto. These pair of screens date between 1616 and 1624, which puts it right at the beginning of the Edo period. The artist of these particular screens is unknown, but it's using 
conventional genre screen painting styles, such as the golden clouds that are used to separate scenes from one another throughout both screens. You can come through and you can look at these screens. The key buildings are actually identified by cartouches, where the names of the buildings are written on them in Japanese. I strongly encourage you to come to our lecture given by Professor Matthew McKelway on Saturday, April 12th. He is an authority on these specific pair of screens. So if you are a Kyotophile and you wanna know everything there is to know, get your tickets now because I'm pretty sure that this is going to be a very popular program. The third section of the exhibition is the East section, which we're devoting to Edo, which is of course now modern day Tokyo. This section is dominated by ukiyo-e prints. Ukiyo-e literally means images of the floating world. And to my right, we have a print done by one of the masters of ukiyo-e, Katsushika Hokusai. Ukiyo-e was able to be many things to many people. It was landscapes, it was pictures of beautiful women. Also in this print here, it was a form of an announcement. And this Hokusai print is actually a farewell performance of Bando Mitsugoro III. Bando Mitsugoro was an actor who was famous for doing a dance called the Shichihinge, in which during this dance, they would actually change clothes seven times on stage and use seven different props throughout the dance. So Hokusai is kind of indirectly referring to the performance by using the props that would have been used therein and showing them rather than an actual, actual actor or performer performing the dance itself. The final section of the exhibition is the North section, which we are devoting entirely to the Ainu people of Hokkaido. The Ainu are an ethnic minority in Japan. In the most recent census completed, there are only about 25,000 Ainu still living in Japan. So to my right, we have a scroll here that is third of a set of three in the set that's called Ezoshima Kikan, which translates to a strange view of Ezo Island. Mainland Japanese, known as Wajin, referred to the Ainu as Ezo, which literally meant different northern person. This particular scroll in this set of three is devoted to hunting and gathering. And there's one particular story that creates a through line throughout the actual visible part of the scroll in our exhibition. And that is the ritual hunting and killing of a bear that was known as Iomante. So at the beginning of every year, a bear cub was captured from the wild by the Ainu people and brought back to one of their villages, where until the bear was old enough to eat fish and other type of meats on its own, it was actually breastfed by an Ainu woman. Then every year, towards the beginning of fall, usually around October, they would actually sacrifice that bear, then the bear would be cooked and they would have a three day long feast during which they would give thanks for the sacrifice of the bear. And each one of these sequences is shown in the scroll with a corresponding text above each one so you can follow what is happening throughout the scroll even if you don't read any Japanese at all. Points of Departure, Treasures of Japan from the Brooklyn Museum, is open until Sunday, June 8th, so you've got plenty of time to come in and see us. We've got several exhibition-related programming, lectures, and stay tuned to Japan Society's main page for information about the exhibition and all the other stuff we've got going on at Japan Society this spring. So hopefully, I will see you here soon.